We've worked our way through the Psalter over time. Yeah, let's say sanctification is a process. <laughs> and, uh, so we've, we've worked our way through it uh, to this degree. But um, so we'll have, uh, we're in Psalm 149. And the, the last Psalms of the Psalter, so the Psalter begins, if you recall, um, the Psalter begins with Psalm 1. I mean, it's kind of a Captain Obvious statement, isn't it? But it, Psalm 1 is this invitation to walk the way of wisdom. So in a sense, you know, and it contrasts the way of wisdom versus the way of the fool and the ways of righteousness versus the tents of the wicked and, you know, the streams of the living. And so basically there are two paths. And so in some ways, Psalm 1 presents itself as the gate to the Psalter. And if you, basically it's saying, if you walk through this gate, you are walking the way of wisdom and of righteousness and the ever-living streams and, and, and enter, entering into the life of God's self through praying the Psalter. So you have the, the front gate. So at the end of the Psalter, the Psalter ends with praise. Psalter, which, in a sense, if you think about the whole arc of the Psalter itself, um, in a sense that having begun with an invitation to learn wisdom, old has the beginning of the, of the journey of the, of the faithful and, and, and of God. It ends with what is the end result? What, in a sense, what kind of person does it, in a sense, what kind of person does it invite? Psalm 1 tells us, it invites those who seek wisdom, those who seek the ways to walk in the ways of the Lord. But when they've gotten to the end of that walk, what, where do they end up? And the Psalter is crystal clear. They end in praise. And it says that first line of this psalm as well, the ending, the last five psalms of the Psalter, praise the Lord. That in a sense, praise the Lord is offered as the culmination of the human vocation. That in a sense, the, the culmination of all of our lives of everything that we say and do has been heading to this moment. Praise ye the Lord. That the praise of God is the human vocation in its totality. And it says that, that when you sum up our lives, the, the essential question is, have these lives been a praise of God? Right? Or something that it says, have, to quote my sermon, and for those who haven't heard it yet, to pre-quote the sermon, have they, been a, have they been a token of trust in that invites others into the courts of God's presence? You know, again, the temple itself has the symbol of being God's presence. Have the lives of the faithful been something that brings the, the congregation of the faithful, to quote the Psalms, into the courts of the Lord, into God's own presence, not a geography, but a relationship. So to praise the Lord is to be, you know, in the, the goal, the telos, is to be in the deepest possible relationship with the loving God, is to be in praise of God. And to show and to praise God in manifesting the transformational effects of that relationship outward. In a sense, can people, you know, I can't hear you. You know, can people hear our lives? And in some way, you know, again, with it's a, you know, and again, I gotta be in my bonnet about this for some reason. But you know, but in a sense, can people, you know, people want to say, I, you know, we, we need to, you know, on the, the public square, we need to get out there and, and, you know, but can they hear our lives louder than our voices? That is the true praise of the Lord. That the, the, the seeker of wisdom, right? If you've come into this seeking wisdom, seeking to walk and act in, right, in the ways of the Lord, that people will hear your hear your life as praise. And that's Psalm 149. All right, so the other psalms of praise get into Sundays, right? They they make it on a Sunday. And really, in some way, Psalm 149 gets eliminated. You can tell which ones, you know, you can look right away at the verses that kind of get it blackballed, 
uh, from the lectionary, the uh, two-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the people. So it's like, okay, off, you're out, you're voted off the island. Um, so, but we'll get to that, we'll get to that. So, but in a sense, Psalm 149 is kind of concluding our little salt, you know, Psalter. And again, as I was explaining this class to uh, Bishop Andrews, who was here to preach at the ordination a week ago Saturday, and, and I was talking about it, and I said, you know, by doing the Psalms that are not on the lectionary, basically, what does that leave you with? And, and he, he both said, we both said at the same time, imprecatories, <laughs> you know, like, you know the, the, the curses, and you know, like, and, and, and I said, and laments. So I said, I've been training my people, before we have this fire, I've been training my people to lament. Like, they should be good at it by now. You know, I mean, at least the people who come to my class should be good at lamenting, because that's all we've been doing, <laughs> lamenting and cursing our sins, um, as opposed to our enemies. Um, so, uh, you know, that's been our journey so far. But again, part of the totality of, of the Psalter is, again, that Thanksgiving is what we typically get on Sundays. Thanksgiving for God's protection and provision in the midst of all those things we are lamenting, in the midst of the violence which we find inflicted upon us um, by the world, that it all is, all of those things, though everything is headed towards praise. That's really important. That, that in a sense, all that, the way that the Psalter has, we've experienced it, and we've been, in a sense, we've been hearing, you've been hearing through this class, the Psalter in a minor key. And so on Sunday mornings, we get, we get all the major key, you know, um, psalms. So you've only been, we've only been singing the psalms in this minor key, but in a sense, it's all headed towards this moment of praise in which it culminates, right? Uh, ultimately, the, you know, the last words of the Psalter in Psalm 150, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. I mean, that's the last word. And so Psalm 149 participates in this conclusion. It's a hymn. So in terms of its genre, uh, it, is a, it is a hymn. And so sing, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the pistons of the faithful. And the new song is, again, is the symbol of that future breaking into the present. The new song is the song of the dawn. It's the Easter song, the song of new creation. And for the hope of Israel, remember, the Israel that puts the Psalter together in its order is the Israel that has been through exile and is now back in the temple. And, and so these have been ordered for temple worship. But again, as I've said, you know, and, and you know, again, again, that they are still occupied. They're not a free people. They're on their land, but they're still, they've got the pagan overlords. So the new creation that they're yearning for has not yet materialized. And so we join with the people of Israel in the setting of the song, calling out for a new song to be placed on our hearts and our lips. We want to be able to sing the new song of alleluia in our lives in this world. So to sing to the Lord a new song is to sing a song of new creation. And to go with this metaphor of song has life and singing has walking, has living, kind of song has lifestyle, if you will, then to sing a new song, to the Lord a new song is to offer him up new creation lives lives that have been shaped by the power of the resurrection and his praise in the assembly of the faithful and so all this so this assembly of the pistos of the faithful is again this uh, a communitarian presentation of salvation that is that the new creation isn't something that comes to us as individuals but in an assembly the Greek word for that would be the ecclesia, <laughs> ecclesial, that's where we get that word, the assembly in the church, right? And, the, and of course the Greeks would hear in the, new, in the, in the, in the early church, the, the, reading the Psalms and the Greek 
they would hear sing the Lord a new song, his praise in the church of the faithful. They'd see themselves in the Psalms. And so we're called to, again, read ourselves into these Psalms and to know that, in a sense, new creation life is something that's called to break out in a community of the faithful. It's not a solo project. It involves each and every human person, but it is not a solo project. And uh, again, I get think, you know, in my during my collegiate career, you know, I was a rower, you know, and again, it's just like I feel like I feel like rowing is a, you know, partial to it, but I mean, it's just a great metaphor because every person has to pull. You've got to pull. Every, every individual has a role to play in pulling on that oar, but everybody's heading the same direction and everybody's got to get to it together. And you all cross the line together with the bow ball of that boat, right? And so, in a sense, that's life in community, where we're all expected to pull on that oar and um, to be and to do it together. So it's good. It's like, you know, life with Christ is, is sweet rowing, not sculpting. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a dig at all the scholars. Um, let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. And in this one little verse, what we have in this one little verse, be glad in its maker and let the children of Zion rejoice in their king, is an evocation of the twin realities of Israelite monotheism, which are a creational monotheism and an elective monotheism, in the sense that they acknowledge both their creator and their savior, that they, that they are a chosen people, right? The children of Zion rejoice in their king. And so that's part of what we, you know, come to the table, that in, in the life of Jesus, he, Jesus himself also summarizes it, both realities of creation of the whole of the universal vision of God as creator and therefore as father of all creator maker of all things but also God is the one who elects who chooses who has favor who blesses and so for example that's some of the freight being carried by the uh, Jesus stilling the storm what kind of what? What kind of man is this that even commands the wind and the waves? It's the creator. You know, he's that, that's what you're, you know, that's what the reader of the gospel is supposed to, is like, ah, you know, you fools, he's a creator right there. Of course, you know, we miss it all the time too. Uh, and, uh, and so he, but then there's also this aspect of you got the 12 in the boat, which is the symbol of Israel. So both creator and elector slash savior is represented even in that sign of the, the, the Jesus in the storm, the civil storm. So, because these are the two kind of twin pillars of Israelite monotheism, that they knew, the, the God they knew, the God of who made all things, has created them, the Lord of heaven and earth, is also the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Both those things are true. So, that's um, so that in this in verse two we have that evocation both of the maker and the savior of Israel, the one who calls Israel to be in a special relationship with God as king. With God as king. So remember, so think of the date. You know, so, you know, Psalter post exile. Um, you know, it, I, I like to say basically the way that the the Davidic. Um, how the house of David, you know, the Messiah that was, you know, it, there was some doubt. I mean, there was some discussion about is the Messiah going to be from the house of David? There, you know, there's some, you know, back and forth about that. You know, indications seem to think, you know, that would be good. I mean, that would bring that story to a fitting conclusion um, in the Messiah coming from the house of David, but maybe not necessarily uh, because one of the problems is practical because, in a sense, you know, that movie, um, it's an Anne Hathaway movie, as well as Anne Hathaway movies, but you know, it's just went cute. Uh, but you know, like where she's like the princess of Genovia, you know, like she and she's revealed, she's just living as an everyday modern American teenager, but she's revealed to be this, the, the, the heir of the throne of Genovia. I can't believe I made that poll in the name of that country. But anyway, it was like, of all the things to remember, I was like, my is like, I'm all I can remember more important things, but anyway, I remember Genovia. And, um, and so, 
uh, I, it's like, it was like that with the, the House of David. In a sense, they lost the thread of the direct heir. They, in a sense, they really didn't know. There wasn't a direct heir of David left. They, there was a family of David. I mean, there was a clan of, you know, there was the, the house of Judah, and there was a clan around Bethlehem, you know, that, that remembered, yeah, we're, we're Bethlehemites, you know, and, but they, they, they didn't know who was the, so there was a, a bit of mystery, but also difficulty in that there wasn't a clear heir apparent. And so to be a, a Davidic messianist is kind of, it was to live in hope, like we don't know who it is, could be any, you know, could be you, I don't know, it's good. So they, they lived in this doubt, but ultimately, ultimately, they believed that there would be a king and that the Messiah would, would, would be the king in this way that would rule for Yahweh directly and, and not as the old kings of Judah rule, but that the new king with a capital K would be someone who rules directly in tandem with Yahweh. And just, you know, I don't preach on the gospel from this morning, but basically that's what's at stake when Jesus says the Father and I one are in Greek. <laughs> he holds that verb in the Greek. The verb goes at the very end of that sentence, and so it's kind of like you, he, the, you just have to imagine the crowd on just on titulars, because he's like the Father and I one are. You know, at the very end, it's like that's the punchline, though, because it's like the the expression of that identity, you know, and uh, and then they pick up stones, like ah, and um, but in a sense, that's the kind of king that Israel's awaiting. So we are glad, and so in a sense, it's the psalm of praise presents that future hope is something that's already been accomplished, which we've seen in the psalms again and again that. The praise of God is, is offered up for deliverance that we hope for, but we express as something that's already occurred. Because God is God. And he's already done it, and he's going to do it. Right? So, um, so there's that. There's Psalm 2. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and psaltery. Well, it says lyre. But that's what the... You know, where does, where, where does the word psalm come from? It's, that's why psalms equal David. You know, David, David plays the harp with Saul. I mean, you get in the story, it's all together, it's one thing, you know. Um, so, you know, so, you know, um, Augustine, at the, towards the end of his series of sermons on the Psalter, he says, you know, let us praise him with psaltery. It's right there. You know, like, and, and so we're literally doing that. Um, so we praise him with psaltery and to praise his name with dancing. Huh. Like, it's like, that'd be news to some people in the Midwest and South. Like I say, like, so my, you know, my, you know, so, some of you grew up in these places, right? And, and, and in small town Kansas, in Dodge City, where my grandfather was the Method, Methodist district, district superintendent, and uh, the pastor of the United Methodist Church in Dodge City in Hayes and Wichita. Um, but out in, out in Winfield, Kansas, where my mother went to high school, my parents were kind of like, or my grandparents were kind of like the cool parents in town. And in their basement, for, you know, in every, every house, but you know, Kansas has like that basement. And in their basement, they would have a record player and they would have dances for my mother and her friends. And they would put, you know, they put the record on, and they would let them dance downstairs. And my grandparents would be upstairs, and they kind of looking out for, looking out for any Southern Baptists who were around, and something like that. They're the Methodists, were like the, the men's like you still couldn't drink, and you couldn't gamble, but you could dance as a Methodist. So it's kind of like, you know, there was a, there was their, their evangelical strategy. It's like still no on the dancing, no on gambling, but yes on dancing. The, the teenagers like take it. You know, we'll take whatever we get. So, you know, to dance, here we are, and, and, you know, to dance in our praise is an evocation of the embodiment of the praise, embodiment of the Christian lifestyle, of that praise has living, that to dance is to move that body, is to move yourself and to be in, in a sense, space and time. 
has an evocation of the beauty of, of following a discipleship of Jesus and of God. That the, the praise his name with dancing. So we have our dancing here. But you know, that 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 singled out by the Psalter has the embodiment of new creation living. Right? So that we're called to, in a sense, that at food pantry you all are dancing. Because you hand that's your dance is to hand out that food. You can do it the rhythm. <laughs> but you know, but uh, you know, put something on the background. It, maybe some swing, like what my grandparents played. <laughs> like, yeah. We have to remember what they were playing on the radio. It was like kind of like Bing Crosby and you know, kind of like you know that kind of stuff. Uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, so the Lord takes pleasure in His people and adorns the humble with victory, or another way to translate word, that word is rescue. Rescue. And since we, again, and that's so important to hear because the people of God heard victory has rescue because basically you're losing, you know, like you're in danger. They were the underdog perpetually. So for them to win is not some sort of progression of what is naturally to occur. <laughs> you know, if you were, if, if, you know, it's like the, they, they were not a people for whom the graph was going up and to the right. <laughs> you know, that is like took a downward turn. Um, you know, you know, after Solomon, basically down. Um, so it hadn't been going up but to the right for a long time. And so to be delivered means to be rescued. So any sort of positive outcome is a rescue. And now remember about rescue, see a victory is something that you could possibly achieve. But if you are rescued, it means you couldn't get yourself out of the jam. Someone had to come to rescue you. It's like 911 had to come to you. You're in the well and you can't get out, right? So you had to be rescued. It's not climbing, right? You know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, you didn't climb yourself out, but you had to call someone to come and get you. And that's how Israel experienced their relationship with God. God is the one who comes and gets you. When you're in a jam, when you're in that hole, that you can't get out of yourself. God is a rescuer. That's what it means to be a savior. It's to save someone, you know, like out of the pool. You know, it's like you throw the thing. You know, because they're like, well, oh. and that's what we are. We're drowning, right? And we need someone to save us. We need someone to rescue us. So God has rescuer. Is a key part of the character of God, and we praise God for his rescues of us. And he does so, he does so, in verse 4a, that the Lord, Yahweh, capital L-L-O-R-D, is the tetragram, so Yahweh takes pleasure in his people. Just think about that. The, 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 the Israelites said that despite the fact that they always get themselves in jams, <laughs> that they always mess up, that they can't seem to just, you know, make it. They're not a superpower. They get beat up by every people group that comes through the Fertile Crescent. But God takes pleasure in them. Not in Egypt. Not in Assyria. Not in Babylon. Not in Greece. Not in Rome. But he takes pleasure in the least of these. He takes pleasure in those who need to be rescued. That's the God we know in Jesus. The God who takes pleasure in, in, in people who can't make it on their own. Which is not, again, that is our, his ways are not our ways. You know, we... I mean, I, I mean, even with my own children, I find when people can't, you know, get it together, I find it annoying. But God, they, right? I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's hard. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, go, go, you know, it's like, uh, you know, go do your chores. No, that's annoying to me. But, <laughs> but God takes pleasure in all of us, especially when we need to be rescued, right? And let the faithful pistos, as Paul would call them. As, and by the way, the, the earliest name for the, the Christian people, what Paul calls the congregations, is, um, you know, well, in Acts of the Apostles, we have, well, they were called, it was called the Way back then, you know, that was the first thing. This was the first time people called them 
Christian, you know, like, like basically um, back then Christians was kind of like partisans of Christ or Christianizers or, you know, it's kind of like, you know, and it was a diminutive, it was an epithet. But Paul calls his congregations the faithful, the pistoi. To all the, you know, to you, sometimes you use holy ones, but in the, it's his salutation to all the saints in court, to all the hagioi, that's the, the holy ones in court. But in the body of the, it's like, he's like he'll say in Thessalonians, the word has spread among all the pistoi, among all the faithful about your love. And that, and, and, and so in a sense that we as God's people gathered together, that the way that we know ourselves is that it's like not the successful, not the glamorous, not the, you know, fill in the blank, but simply as the faithful. As a, and faithfulness so often looks like the way it looked for, for Jacob when he meets God in Bethel, or the angel of God in Bethel, where he refuses to let go, right? He's wrestling with the, you know, the angel of God, and he says, I'm not going to let you. He's like, let go of me, dawn's breaking. I'm not going to let you go until you give me this. That, 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 and then he gets a new name, Israel, or in the word for Israel, it, it basically is, is he, Jacob is grasper, and Israel is struggler. He goes from being a grasper to being kind of a, a struggler, one who struggles, one who struggles with El, with God. And so we, if we basically to be faithful, is to grab onto God with both hands and not let go. To grab onto God and not let go. So I'm not going to let you go until I get my blessing. Even though it feels to us like God is sometimes trying to shake us off, you know? <laughs> um, it's like, ah, I just can't get this off me. And uh, and so, but you just gotta right, you just gotta grab, you know, it's like or like a horse is trying to buck you up. You just grab that that top mate down there with both hands. You just you hold on, you hold on, because that's what it means to be pissed off, to be faithful to God, to hold on to Him. So the pistos exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. What is it about singing for joy on our couch? <laughs> okay, so context time. So furniture was very rare in the ancient world. <laughs> like, let's just say that most of the time you sat on the floor, like that you reclined, right? So the Last Supper. And so like you would have like maybe a little cushion, you know, a little something with some, you know, sheet, you know, some, you know, wool packed in a little, you know, and then that's what you would lean your elbow on. These weren't like, like, this wasn't like, you know, a big, you know, it's not like a sh you know, furniture show where you have a big fluffy chair. It's like to be, to have a cushion means literally you just cushion your elbow and your joints, you know, and, and, and so you just have little, little cushions. But furniture, tables and chairs were like, were really kind of Roman things. Uh, and they were for the ruling class. They would be seated. The judgment seat was some, was a thing because not everybody had chairs. Very few people had chairs. So if you got to sit down in a chair that marked you as a very special and important person, let alone a couch. So a couch with, and so in the in the prophet Amos, one of his condemnations of the prosperity and luxury and the oppressiveness of the ruling class is that you sit around on your couches all the time, drinking wine and feasting, that while the poor of Israel suffer, right? So it's like you shouldn't have couches while they are in there, you know, lying in your gate. So. So what, so what gives about to sing God's praise on our couch? Because in the new creation, in the deliverance of God of his people, we are all made royalty. That's what's here. It's like you, you oppressed, press, you know, kind of uh, throw away people who get kicked around by everybody who brings furniture into your, you know, like they, you, you go into their chambers and you have to go, please give it to them. And please, let me have this more. You know, it's like, and, and, and you have to, go, and you have to look at them across a table, you know, while they're sitting in a chair, because you know, to lord it over you. You will not. You're not only going to get chairs. You're going to get couches, right? Because you will be at rest. You will be kings and queens at rest. 
And that's the, that's the paradoxical, subversive word of Psalm 149, is that, that God's reversal of human priorities, his reversal of human power, his reversal of human violence, his subjugation, is one in which his people will be at rest, seeing his victory. In a sense, you know, like, for, like there's this phrase where, um, I think it's applied to David and Solomon, but at least at least one of them, and I can't remember, Genova, I remember Genovia, I remember that, but I can't remember if it's both David and Solomon or just one of them, but where it says, and David rested from all his works because he had conquered all his enemies, right? And so then he rests. And so it's not like David took a nap. That's not what it means. It means that, in a sense, the conflict was over, and just it basically the peace and prosperity began. And so, again, that's the biblical vision of Sabbath, right? It's not about inactivity, it's about enjoyment of the creation. It's about enjoying it. Because remember, chapter 3 of Genesis, the creation is experienced as a place of suffering and work. It's, you know, kind of like the sweat of your brow, right? And so Sabbath is that evocation of our future in Christ, the future of the resurrection, in which we simply, we have the joy of the garden, right? It's kind of like, you know, if you go into your garden and you, you, you know, you've already done all the weeding and you just, and the fruit is coming up and you could just, you're in that season where you can just walk out of the garden, take something off the fruit tree and just eat it right there. You can sit down and be at rest and just eat the fruit. That's Sabbath. That is kingdom. That is resurrection. That's the vision. Right? So that's what's being evoked by that they will sing for joy on their couches. Um, and we, with our Protestant work ethic and our prosperity gospel, we have a hard time understanding. You know, like we, they will sing for joy in their boardrooms. You know, they, they, will, they will sing for joy when they read the prophet reports. It's like no, <laughs> like, that's disgusting. Um, let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. And so, of course, the Epistle to the Hebrews picks this up as a symbol for the Word of God. Augustine says it's the Old and the New Testaments. <laughs> it's like the two-edged sword through which we win the victory of faith. And, and again, Augustine, from his perspective in the mid-fourth century, says, well, I mean, we just see it. I mean, there are hardly any pagans left. We have won. <laughs> like, you know, like there is, like, you know, we have won with our two-edged sword of the word of God. And, you know, hooray for us. You know, hooray for the church God. Uh, so that's that's how Augustine reads all this, the, and it's like execute vengeance on the nations, and like, and we did it. We made them Christians, <laughs> which again, that's a, I mean, it's a wonderful kind of, uh, a, you know, a twist on this in the sense that the vengeance of the Jesus people is to make them Jesus people. It's a it's a revenge without violence. It's that is 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 that kind of heaping burning coals of kindness upon their heads, as Paul would say in chapter, the end of chapter 12 of Romans. It's that notion where our victory is won not through violence, but through love. And so we use the language of battle because in this broken world, that's what we got. <laughs> you know, because we experience life as battle. We experience change as something that's generally coerced. We experience, you know, but in but we use these lang but but we use this language in a subversive fashion, and that's what poetry is about, isn't it? I mean, in a sense, poetry. Some of the most effective poetry is something that takes a word or a phrase that you think you know, and reveals it to be something utterly alien and yet delightful, alien and challenging, that invites you to think about your life in the world in a completely new way. It takes familiar words and puts them into something unfamiliar and therefore capable of creating change. And so when we as Jesus' people, when we as Jesus' people take this language of battle and of vengeance against not nation states, but the, the ethnes, the vengeance on the peoples, right? When we use this language, 
we are using it poetically. That is, we're taking something that, at our best, unfortunately, some people do it literally and not poetically. <laughs> but when we appropriate this poetically, as, that is, as a part of the Christian good news told as story in our lives, we take that which the world, with which the world is familiar and reveal it to be a source of unexpected and surprising challenge and joy. And in that way, we wreak vengeance, justice, God's making things right again on the peoples, on the peoples of the earth. In a sense, the punishment of the peoples is to have to abandon their ways of violence. And those who are trained to violence, you know, in a sense, if you said, like, you have to write with your right hand now, I'm left handed, by the way. So if you're, it's like, you, you can no longer use your left hand, you have to, it's like, that's a punishment. I'm, I'm having to, I'm having to do something unfamiliar to me. I don't like how I do this. I, am uh, hey, hey. well, it's punishment, but... In a sense, it's also a way of bringing someone into some of that which is new. And so to, uh, the punishment of the peoples that the people of Jesus bring, in a sense, is forcing them to go through life without their violence hand, to go through life without their hatred hand, without the fear hand, you know, you know, without the hand of death. And to have to learn to do life with that unfamiliar hand which God gave to us, you know, he gave us that other hand, the hand with which we reach out in Jesus' love. That's punishment. That's punishment. And so, again, one of the things I think that we have to, one of the myths about following a, a Jesus, that we have to explode, especially we Episcopalians, I mean, and not just Episcopalians, I think just generally like those of us who inherit the kind of the pro liberal Protestant consensus, post-World War II consensus, is that coming to Jesus and following Jesus is not comfortable and is not necessarily um, transparently uh, persuasive, which is what I'm getting at. You know, it's like we, and it's kind of like, it's almost in the sense like the Episcopal Church welcomes you if you can find us. <laughs> And the Episcopal Church welcomes you if you can follow along the service, right? You know, and that's before the age of leaflets. Right? So, you know, the and we and, we, and I know and, and Episcopalians, you know, you probably been Episcopalian for a while. It took pride. It's like, oh yeah, we got we got to do you got your prayer book here, and you got your hymnal here, and then you know, and 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 we, and we liked it that way, right? We liked that it wasn't easy. In a sense, we made all the, in my judgment, we made all the wrong things hard and all the wrong things easy. In a sense that following Jesus is hard, but we need to make knowing him in our midst easier. But we have to also understand that to change the way you view the world is disconcerting and painful. It's painful to change the way you view the world. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Um, it's like putting a glove on the other hand and trying to catch fly balls, right? And we also have to have patience for the fact that when we get, try to get people to do this, they're going to miss a lot of those fly balls, right? They're going to they're going to drop a lot at the beginning. And we have to have that patience where it's difficult when we are trying to train people to think Christianly. They may not get the whole thing all at once, and neither will we. If anything, if we learn anything from the Gospels, especially Mark's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, most of all, Luke is easier on the disciples. But Mark's Gospel, if anything, part of that narrative is supposed to teach us that the disciples were wrong most of the time. You know? Um, again, Luke is, Luke can come off better, but that's, that he's, 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 he's grinding his own axe with that. Um, so we inflict vengeance on the peoples, punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron. I just have to share it. Augustine has a funny take on this. He says, well, what does this mean? That kings and nobles will be bound in fetters. And basically his point is, you know, when you're wealthy and powerful like that, you typically, like, you, you, you typically get to do what you want to do. 
And then when they become Christians, we baptize them. They don't get to do that. And that's painful for them. And so we've been like, and so like, this thing, like when, again, this is like a Christendom, the, the earliest generations of Christendom, where like nobles of the Roman Empire, and basically, no, you can't do that. <laughs> like, you, you can't do that to your servants. No, you can't, you can't uh, follow the Greco-Roman life way around human sexuality. You can't do it. Uh, no more orgies for you. And, and, and Augustine says that's really hard for them to hear. <laughs> it's just, just like, you know, it's really tough. And it's like, it's like, you know, so, you know, throw them a bone, you know what I mean? It's just tough, but, you know, here it is. We found them in, you know, chains of iron as they are kind of taken almost against their own will into the kingdom we're dragging them, you know, it's like, and so, but in some ways, what it does point out more universally is that we all like to be sovereigns over our own lives. And to be brought into the kingdom and be confronted by the moral demands of the gospel is, to quote Jesus' word to Peter from last week, to be bound hand and foot and taken where you don't want to go, where you wouldn't have chosen. But that is the way of love for you, that Jesus is going to ask of you things that you wouldn't otherwise choose to do or not do if it weren't for him. Right? If it weren't for him, then you go on and do it because there's no penalty. Why not? Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. So we all want to be sovereigns over our own lives. We all want to be kings over ourselves. But we have to understand that we're called to rejoice in our king. And that's Jesus. And to execute on them the judgment decreed. For this is glory for all his history, all his faithful ones. And so to execute judgment is, is, again, this moves the psalm into the eschatological vision, right? And it says this, to execute judgment, when we see this, especially in the scriptures of the New Testament, that judgment is something that is, in a sense, removed from the hands of the faithful ones to, and placed in the hands of the God who makes all things right, right? The hands of the God who will save his people. And judgment, in a sense, to be a judge over Israel, if you look at the book of Judges, there's not a forensic scene in the whole thing. Right? There's no courtroom scene in the book of Judges. The judges are those who save Israel. That is, they judge Israel by saving it from foreign occupation or oppressors. And they win victories, typically military victories. And since Samson is a judge of Israel, he doesn't, but he doesn't sit on a bench. And so to execute judgment is to speak in the language, not a forensic condemnation. That's not our role, right? That's, not, that's, not, that's Roman, that's pagan. But to execute judgment is to finally save, finally purify, finally cleanse, finally heal, finally make right, finally put to order the disordered human person and community. That is what it means to execute judgment. And we participate in that execution of judgment, that eschatological victory of love and the way of mercy and abundance by beginning to model our lives on it. That's how we participate in it. Not by being in the judgment seat, but by beginning to, in a sense, as St. Peter, this is what this is what St. Peter's talking about, is kind of a weird phrase, but he says, you know, basically judgment begins with the with the elect. It's gonna begin with the church and then go from us out to the world. That's what he's kind of talking about, in a sense that judgment, salvation, putting to rights begins with the people of God and goes from us out into the nations. That's what was the original vision for Abraham where God's ways and his judgment was given to Abraham and his descendants, the people of Israel, and culminating in the law of Mount Sinai, for them to spread through the nations, to kind of model for the nations kind of monotheistic, authentic humanity. And so in Jesus now, we begin to engage as we walk through our wilderness time, as we walk to the land of promise, the resurrection, 
to, you know, you know, kind of conform our lives to Jesus' life rather than to the life of this world. This is glory. Um, and the glory is the, and again, to if you look at that whole that whole set of phrases all the way from seven through nine, the glory for the pistoi, for the faithful ones, is the reconciliation of all nations, of all peoples in Christ Messiah or in Jesus Messiah. That's that's the vision. Is that why are why are we doing all this vengeance on the peoples? It's to bring them into a unity. And it says anything in that community that would make unity, peace, joy impossible, it's got to go. It's got to go. It's, you know, it's, there's no future for it. And that's unequivocal, and that can sound harsh. Right? That can sound harsh to us. But in some ways, the harshness of those words is an indication of our privilege. Because the, to the oppressed, it doesn't sound harsh at all. To the poor, it does not sound harsh at all. To those who suffer, it doesn't sound harsh at all. That God has not put everything right and no exceptions, and nothing will be left undone. So if we're uncomfortable with that, it's maybe it's because we got a few too many eggs in the basket of the status quo and the way things are. And we resist the changes that must occur for God's victory, his rescue, to take place. To take place. It's like, oh, sure, you go. Yes, I mean, they're just suffering to such a big rescue them, Lord, as long as you don't discomfort me. Save them, Lord, as long as I lose nothing in the process. That's got to go. It's, there's no room for it in the kingdom of God. And so we are left with this word that, in a sense, let's get on the side of the pistoi. Let's be faithful ones, those who are ready to conform our lives in the midst of difficulty and with many mistakes and missteps, and yet seeking to have our lives conform. And then it ends with praise the Lord. This is what it means to live one's life as in praise of God is to participate in the making right of all injustice, of all suffering, of all dehumanization, so that in the power of the true human being, the Son of Man and Son of God, Jesus Messiah, all of us would be revealed, all peoples would be revealed to be the children of God. Amen. Amen. So, there's the Psalter. So, uh, you know, again, I, I just said, it's coming up next week, I'm not sure. So I, I, I'll let the spirit move me, and you'll find out. If you want to know, you got to go. So uh, we're, I'll either start doing Old Testament stories, or I'll do unopened letters and try to take some blocks of the Pauline literature that don't come out on Sundays. Um, and use as an opportunity to lay some foundation work for sermons in the future. Um, so for example, with Romans, lots of Romans chapter six through eight get on a Sunday, but almost nothing from nine through 11, you know, which follows immediately. So like, so maybe, I thought maybe it would be an opportunity to move through some of those texts and kind of see where Paul's argument is going after we lose track of it when the sermon ends on Sunday. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, have a great week. We'll see you next week. God bless y'all.